another episode of red in the face today myself morgan and dan are joined by another very special guest to discuss the politics of cuba so welcome rob miller from the cuba solidarity campaign so before we get into some of the history of cuba um could you perhaps just tell us a little bit about um the organization rob um yeah sure well i'm the director of the cuba solidarity campaign here in the uk uh we're a membership organization we've got about four and a half thousand individual members and about 500 uh, trade union, mainly trade union uh, affiliates, but also CLPs and some political groups and so on. Um, and also 24 national trade unions are affiliated to the campaign. So we kind of represent uh, a quite a broad spectrum of people in solidarity with Cuba. And we campaign primarily for uh, Cuba's sovereignty, Cuba's right to self-determination, and of course, against the illegal uh, United States blockade of Cuba and for the return of um, Guantanamo Bay to Cuba. So uh, they're, they're kind of the main areas we're quite a broad-based campaign um and we welcome everybody and anybody into uh, the campaign particularly people around the blockade that's brilliant um would you would you say that kind of a one of the core purposes of the organization would be to to kind of dispel some myths about cuba because we were talking just before we started recording about people's perceptions of cuba um and how they vary and how they might not be accurate would you say part of the role of cuba solidarity campaign is to combat those myths yeah, completely. I mean, uh, before the, it was called Cuba Solidarity Campaign, it was called the British Cuba Resource Centre in the early 90s. And that was primarily its purpose, really, to tell people about the reality of Cuba, what was really going on. I mean, most of the information, and, and still today, most of the information people over here get uh, about Cuba is from the United States and, and particularly from uh, Florida. And we can talk about Florida, I'm sure, a bit later on. Um, and so yeah, we, we see Cuba through that prism, through that Western prism, and really what we're trying to do is get over the reality of Cuba and get Cuban voices, the real Cuban voices, to be heard in the West so that we can find out the truth about Cuba, what Cuba's really like from the people who live in Cuba, not from the people who currently reside in Florida, who are about a million people, There's about 11 million people living on, in Cuba. And we want to hear the voices of the people in Cuba. And those voices are very much uh, drowned out in, uh, in our Western mainstream media. You know, you don't really hear from Cubans on the island that often and that's one of the jobs of the solidarity campaign i'm just going to um ask for what was the sort of circumstances in which you became involved with the solidarity campaign because we, we've done a bolivia episode venezuela episode and a colombia one now and sort of people come from lots of different backgrounds into these sort of solidarity campaigns so what's your background and, and how did you get involved okay yeah great well um i actually went to cuba when i was 15 years old um in 1978 so quite a long time ago, I went to a world festival of youth and students um, alongside about 300 British people from the Labour left, from the Communist Party, from the National Union students and so on and so forth. Uh, actually, the delegation included some quite interesting people like Peter, Peter Mandelson was on it, for example. Uh, Trevor Phillips was on it, you know, when they were in the British Youth Council, the National Union students. So it's quite a fascinating uh, period. Charles Clark, who later became Home Secretary, was on it. A lot of people today probably would prefer not to uh, uh, tell people about their connections to Cuba, but they were on that delegation in 1978 with, with lots of interesting people. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. You can imagine as a 15 year old, um, Cuba felt a world apart in the 70s. You know, there were very few tourists going to Cuba, hardly any at all. In fact, uh, it was a few years after the victory in Vietnam um, over the United States and it was a time of real uh, excitement, really, for the left. And, I, you know, I was of the left. And, uh, you know, you had uh, the, the liberation struggles in Africa, across Africa, Vietnam, as I said. 
Um, and, and Cuba was one of those places where you thought, wow, this is, this is a different world. This is something new and exciting and different. And when I got off the plane in Havana, it was all those things. You know, it was just wonderful. It was absolutely wonderful. It was hot. <laughs> it was tropical. It was uh, dance. It was music. It was different, the culture, the vibrancy of it all. And that really got me really excited as a 15 year old. I had a whale of a time, a fabulous, absolutely fabulous time over there. And I've been in touch with Cuba ever since. And I did quite a lot of other things after that. Um, but uh, after college and stuff, I got back involved with the, camp, with the, the Cuba campaign at the time, got on their executive and so on. And then eventually um, when things weren't going too well, uh, we needed someone to do some work. And I, I stuck my hand up foolishly and said, well, I'll do that. And uh, thought I'd do it for a year or two and, and 20 years later I'm still there but uh, you know I'm pleased I am it's, it's been a wonderful uh, campaign to work with you know combining my work with my politics and my, my love for Cuba and uh, you know it's, it, I'm very proud of, of the work that the campaign does um, and very proud to do something in solidarity with with a people that really do appreciate that solidarity and need that solidarity at this time when they're under such uh, constant aggression from uh, mainly from people within the United States, not all Americans, obviously, but from the United States. Sounds like the dream, the dream trip. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely love that. Sorry, Morg. Uh, yeah, maybe we'll have to get uh, Mandelson on next week, although I'm not sure how keen he would be. Um, <laughs> yeah, so if we, obviously, we were talking before we started recording about how none of us are, you know, historians of Cuba entirely, so we're not going to be going into a huge amount of detail about Cuban history, but... And we are going to try and, and give a, you know, a brief overview so that anyone that's interested might want to go over in more detail in their own time. Um, so if we start, I think a good way of understanding Cuba since the revolution is to look at what Cuba was like before the revolution. So if we um, start by talking about Batista's regime, and we, we could go back further, but we'll start there. Um, obviously, from, from what I understand, uh, uh, Batista's Cuba was sort of a, a hellhole of, of crony capitalism, it seems, from what I've, what I've been researching. Um, just a lot of US involvement. Um, I think the US owned like 75% of Cuban land at one point. Um, there was very, people had very few political rights, no right to strike. Um, elections were tampered with. Um, poverty was rampant, people were illiterate. Um, so I'm just wondering, obviously with the criticisms that people have of, of Cuba since the revolution, what, what brought about the revolution? What about Q, uh, Batista's Cuba made the revolution so necessary? Well, I think you've, uh, you, you've summed it up pretty well there, Morgan. <laughs> you, you could be doing the podcast, but um, I, I think, you know, our, you've got to look at the, the, the Cuban situation. You do have to go back because you have to look at the history of Cuba. I mean, Cuba was a, uh, you know, it was a slave-based uh, economy. The Spanish uh, run the society uh, and were the colonial power for many, many years. And it was a brutal uh, society under the Spanish. Uh, the Cuban Wars of Independence started in the 19th century, um, you know, with great revolutionary leaders, uh, Antonio Maceo, um, Cespedes, Jose Marti, who are, lead, you know, are, are inspirational figures in Cuba today. Um, and uh, around the turn of uh, the century, the 19th century, uh, some of those uh, liberation struggles linked in with the U United States, the emerging United States uh, at the time, which uh, fought many battles with the Spanish over dominance in, in, in the Americas. And Cuba was one of those uh, fruits ripe for the picking from the United States. There were a few incidences. Uh, there was a big ship, the, the, the main, which blew up in Havana Harbor and a, a, a lot of uh, American uh, sailors were killed and that was used very much the pretext to bring American troops over to fight the Spanish uh, alongside some of the Cuban nationalists and eventually they defeated the Spanish the Spanish were kicked out and the Americans really took control and at the beginning of the 20th century they signed something called the Platt Amendment which was signed I think in 1902 which really gave control of Cuba to the United States uh, all its foreign policy its economy Economy was basically handed over to the United States. They had complete control. And from then on in, the United States really run Cuba as a kind of uh, a, a bit a, a, a bit like a state of the United States, really. It was, a, it was completely under control of, the, of the, the, the American administrations and they put their own people in there. So there were various dictators, Machado and so on, leading up to Batista uh, in, in the 50s. And of course, 
they, uh, Cuba, Cuba was very close to the United States, it was only 70 miles away, and it was a Caribbean island, and Americans went there, and they particularly went there after Prohibition. Uh, you could get alcohol in Cuba, which you couldn't get in the United States, and very quickly, Cuba became a place where, you know, you could go there, it was a bit freer, there were casinos, there was gambling, there was prostitution, there was alcohol, and it became a kind of a bit of a playground, really, for the United States mafia. Uh, who were looking for areas to to expand um, and obviously they dominated all those kind of areas casinos and prostitution and drugs and alcohol um, and the glitterati from the United States you know all those films that you see with uh, Frank Sinatra and the Goodfellas films and the Godfather you know where you see these kind of richer kind of Americans going over there and enjoying these pastimes in Havana that's all true that's what it was like it became a playground for the mafia for the mafiosa uh, for the elite uh, uh, and they mingled with uh, this criminal fraternity in, in Havana and and then those people aligned to allied to uh, corrupt governments meant that Cuba was just there for the taking really and obviously US corporations uh, particularly United Fruit Company sugar plantations the Bacardi family were making a lot of money in Cuba. It was easy. It was uh, you didn't have a, a resistant uh, population. You know, if, if they resisted in any way through trade unions or so on, they were severely put down with the full backing of the United States, who allowed anything to go in Cuba. And if anyone stood in the way, they were tortured or killed uh, in a complicit triangle between the ruling class, the government, and the mafia. And Cuba became a a, a lovely place, you know, if you look at West Side Story, the film, you know, you go to all Guys and Dolls, you know, where they go over there and not West Side Story, I mean Guys and Dolls, you go over there and it's all dancing and it's Mambo and it's Mojitos and it's all fun and games and Marlon Brando goes over there and isn't it great? But for the ordinary Cuban people, it was a hellhole, as you said, Havana was had uh, probably double the rates of prostitution you, you had in the big cities of America. Uh, black people were uh, excluded completely from society, Liter illiteracy was rife, unemployment was really heavy, um, and the whole there was a massive divide between a few urban centres and the countryside, which was really left. You know, you had campesinos who were cutting cane, and that was really very much it, really. So it was a very, very dis divided society. You had uh, some people, a very few, who benefited from that kind of world, you know, from, from, from the links with the Americans, with the mafia, either in the casinos or the, the plantations or the factories. But the vast majority of the population were excluded, were, were, ex were, were, were demon, you know, were, were separated from society. And, and the, the, the middle class in Cuba was also very disaffected because there was no political uh, uh, freedoms within the country. So you had this kind of... Uh, it, banana republic i suppose you could call it if you want to use that term you know it, it was a failed uh, society for 90 percent of the population it was completely failing them so under batista who was a, a really brutal uh, dictator but in a long uh, line of brutal dictators in cuba uh, cuba was ripe for change uh, certainly was ripe for change and um it was that urban uh, middle class, really, that kind of in intelligentsia, of which Fidel Castro was part, uh, that kind of had an instrumental role within the revolution. And what they obviously were able to do was link to the people in the countryside, uh, the peasants in the countryside, and begin that process of developing a consciousness for change and for revolution. So throughout the 50s, there was this kind of building on the struggles of independence from the 19th century right the way through into the 20th century. So... Whether Batista uh, made it inevitable um, is another question. I mean, certainly uh, Fidel Castro and that group around Fidel and the, the, the leaders uh, of the revolution made a massive uh, difference in that situation um, rather than it would, would have happened anyway. So I think it's, um, you know, it, it's quite an interesting period, but there was certainly, it was certainly ripe for change, that's for sure. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's really useful to talk about that period pre-revolution I think because um, not only does it kind of explain why the revolution happened it also shows the kind of hypocrisy um, of the US and you know some of the rest of the West's um, sort of takes on Cuba nowadays given that they were enjoying this Cuba that existed before the revolution 
with all its you know human rights violations all of its you know stifling of of political freedoms they were enjoying that cuba like you said and using it in a way exploiting it in a way um so yeah it shows a kind of an irony there it shows that maybe they're not totally serious when they talk about human rights violations and such i was, I was gonna say it's quite interesting you mentioned like companies like bacardi so if you see like bacardi's uh brought an advert out not long ago about being like so like a rebel alcohol company and then part of their um advertising they talk about being exiled from cuba and like, well, exiled from our home country and like you say it's well it's because <laughs> the circumstances in which they were operating <laughs> were um extremely beneficial to them and then and then the other company you mentioned i mean if you want a better example of what neo-colonial neo-colonialism looks like in terms of the sort of the use of corporations uh to control governments and for other national governments like america the west to control governments through corporations the united fruit company across latin america is just the the most blatant example you're going to get of that so yeah I, I, with morgan it's it's crazy that again that context never gets given to the discussion about cuba about any of this really i mean the history of the bacardi company is is entwined with with uh, cuba i mean they weren't exiled from cuba i mean none of the people after the revolution were forced out of cuba many left uh, because um for various reasons i mean the, the, the properties were nationalized many of the plantations were nationalized but many people stayed and many corporation companies stayed and had settlements with the uh, the cuban government but the picardi uh family um have continued to be the at the front edge of a political war against cuba and so they, they haven't just been a drinks company with some advertising they've been a protagonist in the whole battle and it was picardi that paid for all the lawyers the legal support but the whole kind of blockade legislation uh, in the 1990s. So they bankrolled Jesse Helms and Burton. They were at the forefront of the whole struggle, and they have been ever since um, in demanding uh, the restoration of their uh, wealth and their rights within Cuba. So the, the blockade is predicated on the fact that people like Bacardi believe that their property, their entitlement was taken from them. And so the blockade is, the legal aspects of the blockade is all about their rights to get that back, the money back, so they can sue Cuba. They can, you know, that's why you have the blockade. And Bacardi isn't just a, a, a you know, a, a symbol of it. Like I say, they're a protagonist. I mean, when I first started working here, they uh, used to um, try to exclude their competitor, which is Havana Club. Now, Havana Club rum is actually made in exactly the same factory that Bacardi um, was made in. And uh, using the same barrels, the same techniques and so on. It's just the Cubans called it. Havana uh, Club when Bacardi left um, and Bacardi have issued endless lawsuits against Havana Club and so forth and in this country they they did a, a thing where they tried to exclude uh, Havana Club from shops and, and, and restaurants and so on over here there was a, a really famous case that we were involved in with the National Union of Students um, and the National Union of Students own a supply services agency called uh, Nussel, I think it's called, with the National Union of Students Supply Company Limited. And they supply all the alcohol, or they used to supply all the alcohol for all the universities and colleges across the country. And in fact, they were either the biggest or one of the biggest uh, purchases of alcohol in this country because for that very reason, they were supplying all college bars and all university bars and the, stu and the NUS were involved. In them. And they had a, an agreement with uh, the student union, the NUS at the time, to... Um, only allow one white rum, which was Bacardi. And it was purely designed to exclude Havana Club. And we took a case, the Cuba Solidarity Campaign took a case to the, um, uh, what they called the um, competition agency um, in this country, which, you know, a fair competition agency, I can't remember its name now. And we won the case um, and Bacardi were absolutely livid. They were absolutely furious because of course it allowed uh, Havana Club into uh, student union bars uh, for the first time. So that, you know, they, they were an active uh, anti-Cuban company. And it's why we in the Cuban Solidarity Campaign have a campaign, which is uh, don't drink Bacardi campaign. You know, we actively oppose people drinking Bacardi. Bacardi is no longer a Cuban rum. It's got nothing to do with Cuba. It's now produced in Nassau. And the company does everything it can to undermine uh, the Cuban people and, and continue uh, the, the, the attacks on Cuba through its support for the blockade. So it's, it's, it's an example of 
why the blockade exists and why it continues to this day and why uh, the United States has this really, I suppose, anachronistic foreign policy towards Cuba. You know, they'll trade with Vietnam, they'll trade with, with China, they'll trade with all these other countries. But when it comes to Cuba, they've got this kind of really sort of strange Cold War policy still going on, which doesn't really make a lot of sense to a lot of people until you really get to understand the mentality of people like Bacardi, the Bacardi family, plus all the other kind of people who used to own Cuba, who are now decamped to Florida, feeling very bitter and twisted about it 60 years later. Yeah, and until you realise that context that you're not dealing with, when dealing with speaking to those um, actors, they're not good faith actors. It's it's not, and like you say, there's a history there. Um, but but for listeners, yeah, you can buy Havana Club. It is uh, at least 50% owned by the... Uh, Cuban government and it's got a little little sticker on the bottom there to say it as well so that's a little shout oh, out it's, for nice. everybody. it's nicer as well yeah it's it is much good. nicer yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> we like we like Havana Club rum yeah definitely Havana Club 7 is my recommendation it's <laughs> gorgeous well if you get hold of the Havana Club 15 you're really talking then. <laughs> you get that, you're really talking I had a uh, good New Year's on on Havana Club one year so <laughs> I definitely I support that campaign always always are willing to campaign for better booze well, well, the uh, word is that there's a 25 year old Havana Club somewhere, but I've never seen it. But uh, <laughs> if you can get over that, I'll be very white open. whale. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, obviously, we touched there on one of the most cont- contentious issues when it comes to Cuba, which is the the blockade, um, sometimes incorrectly called an embargo, as we'll get onto. Um, but I think just to kind of pull back a little bit, and if we kind of talk about the the revolution, obviously we're not going to discuss. Um, the details of the intimate details of warfare, but the uh, well, but post-revolution, if we can discuss maybe some immediate changes to Cuban society that came post-revolution, what 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 did Fidel and um, his men change about Cuba immediately, and maybe with a particular focus on land reform, because I know that was a big issue at the time. Yeah, well, I think that the first thing they did was to. Um... Well, it's the anniversary this year. It's actually the 60th anniversary this year of the Great Literacy Campaign, and I think, or the Alphabetization Campaign. And uh, they very quickly decided uh, went on this change of society. You know, a lot of the population were illiterate, and uh, I've always said, and I'm sure many people can understand that if you're going to have a revolution, you know, if, if you're going to be a nasty, evil dictator, you don't want an educated population. So the fact that they went out to educate everybody, teach everybody how to read and write, teach everybody how to sort of share information is is a very illustrative point about what they wanted to do with that society. They didn't want to keep everyone in the dark and everyone kind of as it was. They wanted to educate the population, which I think says an awful lot in the very first instance about the policies of uh, the new government. So the alphabetization campaign, which kicked off in, in uh, straight after the revolution, was a bit was massive, and it, it really had a secondary purpose or uh, or a result, which kind of gave the opportunity for people in the towns and cities and that educated middle class to go and meet the rest of the population because they went out in their thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, went out to the countryside to teach the peasants how to read and write. So that for the first time, really, there was this understanding about the whole of Cuba. Before that, they were very different societies. You know, you had your urban uh, group and then you had the rest of society. Most people were countryside folk. They didn't, there was no interchange. So the alphabetization campaign meant that there was an understanding from uh, the urban to the rural and vice versa. So there was an interchange of ideas and concepts and of course learning, and that's a great environment to really understand how Cuba itself could change its society. So I think that was incredibly important for Cuba, not just because it taught people to read and write, but because it enabled people to share and understand uh, all about it. Now, obviously at that time, immediately there were attacks on Cuba. There were attacks against the young people who went out to the countryside. Some of them themselves were assassinated by mercenaries, uh, endorsed by the United States, sponsored by the United States, paid for by the by uh, the CIA and, and the counter-revolutionaries. So it very quickly became a question of defending uh, the revolution early on. And the early years of the revolution were all about really hanging on to this revolution and defending it. Obviously, you will get onto the Bay of Pigs and so on. But it was all about trying to stop the sabotage, trying to kind of develop society, trying to build up again a lot of the infrastructure that had, had been lost, the medical service, the education service uh, at the time, many of the middle class 
urban elites had decamped to Florida at the time of the revolution. And so almost a million people left Cuba at that time. And they were mainly the richer uh, Cubans who were associated with the dictatorship or the aristocracy or the owners uh, who perhaps had property in Miami and Florida anyway. They had American connections. They kind of went over to Florida, expected the revolution to end, uh, you know, to fail maybe six months down the road or one year down the road or three years down the road. Of course, it hasn't. And it didn't. So the first few years were, were very much about that. And it was a few years later, uh, obviously, when Fidel declared the nationalizations, when really the United States really started to get fed up with it. You know, <laughs> when they saw their multinational corporations losing the assets that they had in in the in the in the very early days of the revolution, um, you know, the Cubans went to the Americans. They were the natural partners. They went over there. They tried to carry on and keep keep the relationship going, but they were rebuffed pretty quickly. So I think the literacy campaign, obviously, the establishment of um, uh, universal health care and education for people were, were, were incredibly important, and then the land reform, which happened a couple of years later, and obviously the peasants starting to be given land was an incredible. Uh, thing you know the, the land reform was huge in Cuba and it made a massive difference to to the vast majority of people within Cuba so those quite tangible uh, benefits uh, to people uh, obviously gained the revolutionaries a lot of respect and a lot of uh, uh, support because for the first time the Cuban people were beginning to realize that they could control their own land you know their own education their own health service their own people their own wealth it wasn't all about uh, America and about you know all that wealth being transferred out and people looking out suddenly they were looking in they were looking to what they had as a country what they as a people could do how could we as a population get better how could we learn to read and write how could we educate our children how could we farm our own property you know, our own farms and so on and so forth I think so much to sort of touch on I mean the one thing that's quite interesting is that obviously Castro actually went to Washington like months after the revolution so the relationship whilst obviously being uh certain parts of the american establishment strained always strained um you know there was an initial like you say there was an initial line of dialogue there until maybe america weren't fans of their corporations potentially being shut out of of making money out of of cuba um but another thing to touch on as well is is that that initial um, exodus of people to, to areas like Florida and things like that. It's sort of seen again, and sort of with hopefully kind of like a bit of myth busting throughout this episode. It's as if this was some sort of forced campaign of people out of Cuba and uh, by the regime, uh, except by the new sort of revolutionary government and things like that. I mean, from what my understanding is, is that uh, I don't know if this is right or wrong. That essentially the message was: if you want to stay and fight for the re revolution, you can stay. But if you want to leave and go to places like America you're free to leave and the revolution the revolution is not going to stop you from from leaving and as you say obviously a lot of the people that did leave were those that sort of went clutching their pearls yeah no absolutely i mean there was no forcing of anyone to leave cuba a, a lot of cubans had contacts in america anyway they had homes in in florida they had you know they, they, there was a backwards and forwards between cuba and america but in both directions and if you had money in cuba uh if you were at all uh moneyed you went to america that's where you kind of went to you went there on holiday you had a house there that was your aspiration it was it was like cuba was a state of america really it was, it was 70 miles away it's like puerto rico or something that was your aspiration you didn't have any aspirations to go to europe or anywhere else it was america everything was about america it still is for people a lot of people in latin america it's exactly the same america's this big kind of uh, a dream ticket you know that's where you want to end up and that's your dream is to end up there and you get migration from all countries of latin america to america and it was like that in the 50s and even to you know if you go around havana or you go around santiago to cuba you see the american homes in the 1950s you know they just copied they, they look like parts of america obviously the cars you know about the the neon signs it looks like america it's it, it was totally and utterly uh, culturally uh, as one you know, that was the aspiration in baseball is the national sport, the music, everything was about this Cuba, America, Cuba, America thing. Um, and, and the Cuban identity was very much being lost. Certainly the black identity was very much lost in Cuba. So people uh, at the time of the revolution, there was a, the, obviously the Catholic Church played this massive, massive role. Uh, and the Catholic Church basically hated 
that these revolutionaries, they were quite happy with the status quo with Batista and their position in society. Uh, you know, you, you've got that relationship with the institutions of the church and the state, which go back in all these societies. And so the Catholic Church played a terrible role. I mean, what the Catholic Church did was they put out propaganda saying that Fidel and these revolutions, when they get to a manner, of course, they came up the country as they came and the, 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 the propaganda was they're going to eat your babies. You know, they're going to they're going to turn you all into sort of um, anti antichrists. You know, this is. And what happened, they actually facilitated, I mean, it's a terrible, terrible story, but, uh, and, and then we've done quite a lot of work on it. We had a big article in our, in our magazine uh, just recently, it's called Op uh, Operation Peter Pan, they called it. Uh, and they basically convinced Catholic families to give up their children and that the Catholic church would look after the children in the United States so that they wouldn't get, you know, murdered or whatever they thought was going to happen from these bearded revolutionaries and then when they were defeated the revolution you could get your children back and it's something like 3,000 Cuban kids disappeared completely disappeared they went over to America they were not looked after by the Catholic Church in fact many of them ended up being adopted by military families who couldn't have children and they were lost to the ether and in the last 10, 15, 20 years, many of them have come forward realising that, in fact, they were stolen. The families never saw them again. They never, ever if, saw those kids. If, if the shoe was on the other foot and that was, oh, it, that was, that was something so the this, Cuban state had done, my word, we'd never hear the end of it. Unbelievable. But this was the Catholic Church, you know, espousing this idea of freedom and we'll save your children from these horrible revolutions. None of it was true. So there was this climate, really, whipped up. Uh, by many people from the right and so on, the anti-revolutionaries, the, the sort of mercenaries and the people who wanted to keep the status quo, who benefit from the system, just saying that these bearded sort of people were coming to kind of take over and kill us all and it was all going to be terrible. So a lot of people who had, uh, you know, uh, houses or family or whatever in the United States went to the United States. It wasn't like they were forced out. You see films of them, you know, they're getting on the on the planes at Havana Airport carrying their suitcases. There's no, there's no kind of push to get rid of them. The, the opposite is true. But the facts are that of those uh, million odd people who decamped to Florida, they took all the money with them. You know, they, they, Batista went off with suitcases of money. And it was, of course, all the doctors, it was the professors who went because that was the, the, the elite group really who, who departed. And Cuba was very much denuded of its uh, expertise, it's, it's kind of uh, leading lights, really, intellectually, medically, and so on, went to the United States. So it was very, very difficult, but there was definitely no, uh, no forcing out. In fact, the opposite was true. And many, uh, many uh, people stayed. And you, you, you meet them, in, you know, or you, you hear about them. I mean, I, I've met a couple who, who, who were wealthy. You know, they still live in the big houses. They were in, in, in Havana pre-revolution i mean they're a bit run down now but they're still in, in those big houses and they stuck with a revolution and uh you know it's been tough for them they could have gone to america and some of the americans went and then came back again the cuban americans and vice versa there's always been it's a funny thing cuba but for us it's uh you know we we see it as very black and white we see you know the, 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 there's america and there's cuba and they don't like each other you know it's not like that it's uh, most americans it's neither here nor there for them. You know, they'd like to go to Cuba on holiday and, and under Obama, millions of them did. You know, it's in their consciousness as well to go to Cuba, a bit like it's ours to go to Ireland or Scotland or the Isle of Wight or something. You know, it's it's around the corner. It's where you would go on holiday. You know, it would be one of those places you'd go to because it's in all those films. It's in your cultural uh, background, you know, to go there. And again, with the Cubans, America is very much in their cultural, cultural background. And then you've got the Cuban Americans. And that's... The, the key crux of it and it's a bit like a family dispute gone wrong it's a bit like you know when you have a family that falls out with each other it's very very hard to kind of get back on track and the cuban americans you know they have a love-hate relationship with cuba they I, you know and when i say the cuban american i'm not talking about all of them all believing exactly the same thing i'm talking about the, the dominant uh you know grouping who kind of put out this kind of anti-castro kind of anti-communist line that we saw in the elections, you know, in, in America each time it comes around to the presidential elections. They kind of love Cuba. They want to go back there. They want to see their grandparents. You know, they want to uh, eat the food and live the life. And that's why you've got Little Havana, you know, in, 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 in Miami. You know, it, they, they carry on. They don't give up that kind of Cubanness. And then you've got uh, the Cubans in Cuba who want to get on with their own life. So the, it's, a, it's like a really bad family dispute. 
And it, it, it's that family dispute that has kind of warped uh, a lot of the relationships and that feeds out into uh, uh, US uh, politics, particularly into the Republican Party. Um, and Cuban Americans, you know, you can look at the history of that Cuban American community who learnt their trade in the casinos and the prostitution and the torture chambers of Batista and then applied those same tactics across Latin America. Because if you look at every Latin American struggle, and you mentioned uh, Colombia and Bolivia, and you can look at Nicaragua, you can look at the assassination of Pinochet in Chile, you will find Cuban Americans who are the frontline troops, really, of US far right Republican hardline uh, foreign policy across that continent. Cuban Americans are at the forefront of that whole kind of CIA led uh, uh, terrorist campaign against that continent because they've had the training and the experience. And you can pick, you know, John F. Kennedy. You know, you, you can hear the stories about Cuban Americans. Uh, the Nicaragua Contra War, Cuban Americans. Uh, the assassination of uh, uh, Chile, uh, Pinochet. Uh, Oliver North in the Iran Contra. Uh, scandal. Cuban Americans. Cuban Americans have played a pretty, I'm not saying the Cuban Americans, some Cuban Americans have played a pretty uh, dastardly role in carrying out US foreign policy across that continent. And they continue to do so today. So it's a very, within that community, there's a, a very hard line reactionary far right element who are dangerous, you know, they, they train, it's still today training in the Everglades, you know, with guns and bazookas and that, to, so to work just, out where they're going to invade next, you know, they're still going on, you know, they are a terrorist, there's a terrorist group within there uh, who have been responsible for all sorts of uh, things, including bombings in Havana, you know, the, the very first, um, the very first airline bombing, terrorist bombing in the world was a, a Cub Cubana airliner. And in 1976, or was it 1973, one or the other, it was blown up over uh, Barbados. And it was blown up by far right wing Cuban Americans. And it killed 73 or 76, I'll get them muddled up, uh, people over Barbados, including the whole of their youth, the Cubans youth fencing team, carried out by Cuban Americans, sponsored by the CIA, as, a, as an attack on Cuba. In the 1990s, there were hotel bombings. Uh, in uh, tourist hotels in Havana, which killed international tourists, carried out by Cuban Americans. They're a very dangerous mob. They have a, a very strong link to whole sections of the Republican Party. You know, Jeb Bush uh, was uh, governor of uh, Florida. You know, uh, in, in Bush's last cabinet, there were 14 Cuban Americans in the, in the government, in the cabinet. And even today, you know, they, they have a very uh, strong lobby of uh, that political class. They have money, Bacardi family and other uh, corporations. They have uh, power and they have a lot of uh, influence, you know, using violence to kind of, there's a lot of skeletons in the, in the closet. So they have a lot of influence with the far right of the Republican Party. And hence you get this kind of warped policy towards Cuba. They can influence uh, government at the highest level in the United States. The, the parallels as well, I mean, but back to our Venezuela episode, we've got the Venezuela right and the links that you're seeing now when sort of pre-Castro and still some of the richer people in, in Venezuela, uh, families sort of going back and forth from America, very Americanized in their outlook. Um, but a, th a lot of the strongest critics now of uh, people that have left Venezuela to come to America, sort of like YouTubers and journalists, there's always, nearly always a link then back to the fact that one of their families, family members was is a minister in an opposition party that will have links to a far right group in Venezuela. It's just the parallels with, with that is just are so similar. And again, it's when you hear sort of blatant criticism of, of these countries, you know, you've got to do your research to see whether these people saying this are a good faith actor, because some of the links, like you say, are, are so strong to previous atrocities or pr horrible groups that are doing some disgusting things around Latin and South America. Um, so, yeah, it's just a similar parallel. Yeah, I mean, these, these people are not neutral bystanders. You know, they're, they're protagonists in it. And uh, the, the accusations against Venezuela, Nicaragua, Cuba or whatever are all tainted by their history. And uh, the history of, you know, the white ruling class of Venezuela. And that's what it was. You know, it's a white racist elite. Uh, linked to international, you know, I mean, Britain, the, the, the links to the British aristocracy in Venezuela is quite incredible if you dig deep. Um, and the money and the oil and the wealth, and that's what it comes down to. And, 
And, and, and the, the similarities are there for everyone to see between Venezuela and Cuba. I suppose Cuba had it slightly, uh, has had it slightly easier. It's an island. You know, it's a lot of the people left, you know, pretty quickly and didn't come back again. So the Cubans have been able to hang on uh, to what they've got, despite all the sanctions and the aggressions, the invasions, the warfare. And it's very difficult for Venezuela, incredibly difficult, as it is for Nicaragua. And it's, you know, it's very difficult for any any people who want to assert their own independence and sovereignty when they're up against uh, United States, which is the biggest uh, superpower the world has ever seen and all the multinational corporations who have really been milking these countries for centuries and uh, when the people stand up and say well actually that gas is our gas or that that oil is our oil you know or that beach is our beach or whatever they say you know then then quite frankly as we've seen uh, throughout our own history let alone the history in Latin America uh, the ruling class don't like it. It's quite a simple uh, thing. You know, they, they they fight for their class in, in the same way and they're not opposed to using violent uh, methods to do so. Um, and they will not stop at anything really to maintain their hegemony and their, their, their wealth. And that's what it comes down to. And you can see that very clearly when you look at places like Venezuela. So when people, you know, attack the Venezuelans over this, that and the other, you know, you like you say, you do have to look below the surface and you do have to kind of, uh, realise that there's a lot more to this than meets the eye, you know, it's it's not a straightforward, uh, this is good and this is bad, they're, they're, as you put it there are uh, actors within this who, who have their own agendas um, all the way through Yeah, so, so touching on that relationship um, between Cuba and the US, obviously as we mentioned there, was, there were attempts to establish a relationship um, at least from the Cuban side early on after the revolution, but things quickly broke down um obviously we have the um bay of pigs invasion happening in 61 was it Some, something like that um you know which was just an explicit invasion on of of cuban soil uh, failed uh, thankfully um and then we have a kind of what what is called an embargo come in and this is such a crucial point to talk about um i think it came in stages but I'm not, I'm not sure when exactly it became an all out embargo, but it, it is, um, or it was for, you know, the past 50 years. Um, and, and I think it's, in, it's important to talk about that and also to talk about why we, we, we call that a blockade rather than an embargo. And then we'll talk about the effect that it's had on Cuban society since um, the early 60s. So yeah, if we just introduce how, how that came about and how, you know, how it's affected things at that stage yeah well after, after the revolution as, as we, you were saying you know the cubans naturally wanted to carry on with america they didn't i mean 75 percent of all trade in and out of cuba was with the united states it wasn't uh, <laughs> that they didn't have a very deep relationship and they needed to buy and sell the sugar was mainly going to america and that's it was a monocultural uh, monoculture in society in cuba that was the main product and that was the marketplace. And, uh, you know, if that was to go, it would be a real problem. So, of course, they just wanted to carry on. Of course, they wanted to uh, do get rid of Batista and change things a bit. But they wanted to maintain the relationship. And as you rightly said, Fidel went over to to America. And I think it was Nixon at the time. He, he wasn't president, but he was there. He, he There's a famous story of how, you know, he didn't uh, come to the meeting because he was playing golf. And there's some famous photos of Che and uh, Fidel playing golf back in Cuba, you know, take, taking the mickey out of her or taking the piss out of that, that whole situation. But he, he was, uh, he was you know, rebutted really by the Americans and very quickly they started to object to obviously some of the policies um, and with the nationalisations and the way it was going, they started to impose uh, uh, certain tariffs on, on Cuban sugar and it slowly escalated as it went up to become... A, a, an embargo as you call it and then a blockade I mean I suppose the difference really as I see it is that uh, a blockade is all encompassing and it also stops uh, it's not just bilateral it's not just about the United States and Cuba it becomes about the whole world and, and Cuba and the United States isn't uh, I mean you know if Cuba was able to trade with the rest of the world it'd be absolutely fine <laughs> they, okay you know if the Americans don't want to trade with them they could live you know they could be fine but the problem with the blockade is it impacts other countries it's extraterritorial and has been for many many years so it's deliberately designed to stop any uh, trade with Cuba from anybody 
and that becomes then a blockade as opposed to just a sort of bilateral kind of trade uh, embargo between between the United States and, and Cuba. So um, how does that work? How is the US able to, or how is, how are other countries being stopped from from trading with Cuba? Is it is there a punishment from the US for that, or yeah, is it along those lines? Yeah, you, yeah there, there's a whole web of uh, infrastructure in the United States to control and, and police the blockade. So it, it's an ongoing sanctions policy. It was strengthened to make it ex much more uh, extraterritorial in, in the 90s, in 1996 under Helms Burton, which was propagated by the Bacardi family, which really gave uh, the United States or people in the United States the opportunity to actually uh, sue any company around the world that was trading with Cuba because they would be seen to be trading in stolen assets, you know, anything that was in Cuba had once belonged to Bacardi or something. If you're trading in Havana Club, you're trading in stolen assets um, and therefore you should pay fines and so on. So it's uh, it's um, enforced uh, in a very draconian fashion and uh, the fines are incredible. Um, so, for example, I mean, un uh, the Royal Bank of Scotland was fined £230 million pounds Barclays Bank was fined 200 million Lloyd's was fined uh millions and millions of pounds a French bank BNP Paribas was fined wait for it eight billion eight billion dollars Francois uh Mitterrand at the time stood up and said well we're not no sorry Francois Hollande I think he was then stood up and said well we, you know there's no way this French bank is going to pay that to the Americans because the money just goes to the US Treasury. <laughs> they can use it as they want. He said, no, we're not paying that. Our French bank is not paying. But they paid it. They paid $8 billion. Um, And the reason they do it, the reason they pay it, is because, uh, and this is for small trading with Cuba, historic trading with Cuba, you know, maybe something they've missed, some small contracts or whatever. The reason they pay it is because they're given a choice. Do you want to carry on with Cuba? You know, this little tiny little economy here, this is you can carry on trading with them or you can trade with America, which is this humongous worldwide economy and a company like Lloyd's or Barclays, you know, that's <laughs> you can see what they're going to do. They pay the fines, which are settlements. If they don't pay them, they would be excluded from the US economy and directors of uh, companies have been banned from the United States. Some people have been locked up in the United States, primarily Americans who have traded with Cuba and ignored the bans and so on. So it's enforced in a very draconian way with huge punishments. And it's enforced in a way that impacts every aspect of life, uh, of trading or exchange with Cuba. Right now it is virtually impossible in this country to send money to Cuba. There is virtually no way of doing it. So if you've got family there, you know, Western Union are the latest ones to pull out. Most banks won't touch Cuba. The Cuba Solidarity Campaign ourselves had all of our bank accounts closed down by the co-op. The co-op bank, this is our ethical cooperative bank, they shut all our bank accounts down. And when we uh, campaigned against it and forced them to admit it, they put it in writing that this was because, first of all, they said it's because of international sanctions because of international policies. And when they were pressed by ourselves and by members of parliament, they wrote that it was because of US sanctions. And we pointed out what well, the cult's a British bank. We're a British organization. You know, what's this got to do with Britain? They, uh, the co-op still shut all our bank accounts down. In 2017, uh, in 2017, yeah, a young Cuban student uh, was uh, applied to, he was at Westminster University here and he was, he was going for a postgraduate course and he was advised by his lecturer to apply to the Open University. So he wrote to the Open University and they said, no, sorry, you can't have a place. So he wrote back and he said, well, is it because my qualifications aren't good enough? No, no, that's not it. Is it because I haven't got the legal documents? No, no, no. Is it because I can't pay? What, what, what's the problem? They said, in the end, because you're Cuban. So the Open University, this is an, a, 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 a British university set up by the Labour government in the 60s to uh, allow access to people you know, across the board, basically stopped a Cuban from attending the university because of his nationality. Now, we took up the case, and over 200 members of parliament took up the case, all the trade unions took up the case, uh, the lecturers' union, the teachers' unions took up the case. Uh, and in the end, we took a legal case against the Open University on the basis of the 2010 equalities uh, legislation, that it was discriminatory against the whole nation, a whole population. And we won, we won that legal case, but we, and, and we got a settlement for the student and the student went to the Open University a year later. So we won the case, we didn't win it on the blockade, we won it on 
uh, race discrimination, but it was a victory of sorts. But what it shows is the depth to which the blockade is enforced um, and perpetuated. And it just is really designed, and you read the documentation about the blockade itself, and it is designed to strangle the Cuban economy and force the Cuban people into a situation where life is so crap that they want to change. <laughs> they want to say, OK, all right, you've won. Come on back. Take it all back. You know, we need some food. We need some stuff we can't get now. That's what it's designed for. That's how it is explained in the legislation. And that's what it does. Uh, just a few weeks ago, a woman got in touch with us. Um, she'd put a, a, a small... Um, bracelet that she'd got on holiday in Cuba a few years back it made the shells and stuff and she put it on eBay for 99 pence I don't know why people do this sort of thing but they do she was selling a Cuban trinket on eBay within four hours she had a letter from eBay a message from eBay saying if you do not remove your Cuban trafficked goods we will shut your whole eBay site down so the blockade is omnipresent. It's everywhere. It, it affects everything. And that's us. You know, we're British. You know, we're, we're British. You know, we, we, we should be able to do these things. Imagine if you're a Cuban company, you know, if you're a Cuban trying to set up business or, or exchange, it's virtually impossible right now. Uh, you know, we're in a case uh, right now with Just Giving, you know, Just Giving, the, the charity uh, uh, group, you know, they, they've blocked all of our uh, just giving uh, elements. We, we have a charity called the Music Fund for Cuba, which is a registered UK charity, you know, registered um, with the Charity Commission, uh, pays, it has to declare itself each year, it's got its own board of trustees. It's just been blocked from just giving. So just giving because it's uh, a US, uh, you know, they're under threat from the, from the uh, Office of Foreign Asset Control, the US Treasury, the sanctions body in the United States, have decided, well, rather than risk it, we'll just park that lot. They've got Cuba in their title. We won't let them, we won't work with them. Now, you know, for most people, well, so what, you know, but you know, it's, it's an imposition. What, what you've got is US law, a US sanctions policy, which is put, put up against British law, and particularly in the case of the Open University. And it's a battle between our own law, our own sovereign laws, and what we as a nation want. And we as a nation purport to want to trade with Cuba. People go on holiday there. You know, we have a British council which supports trade with Cuba. We have a minister for the Americas who travels to Cuba. We have a Prince Charles, you know, my favourite royal. You know, I'm not a royalist, but he went to Cuba with Camilla. You know, and you know, he was driving around. About. I love all that stuff. You know, I love it all. That's Britain. We don't do a lot of trade with Cuba, but the policy we have is engagement with Cuba, is a positive engagement with Cuba. The United States has got its policy and he's trying to impose its policy on Britain. So it becomes a question of sovereignty of the UK as much as anything. And that is extraterritorial uh, blockadism in action it's not just um an, an arbitrary kind of thing up in the sky it is a real thing that impacts i mean you don't trade with cuba so it doesn't affect you do you know what I mean? most people in britain have nothing to do with cuba it doesn't affect them but cuba is a small country it wants to trade with the world and every time it tries at any little level it the blockade is there at every point so cuba is uh is affected in every way you know and that affects everything from you know not being able to buy a a, a stick to do pole vaulting you know because it's made in america or not being able to buy some medical equipment or under coronavirus you know not receiving uh, a huge donation from the alibaba foundation in china the jack jack ma guy and he sent uh, billions of pounds worth of ppe and vent and ventilator equipment and so on to lots of countries in the developing world the only country that never received it was Cuba because of the blockade, because the shipping companies wouldn't ship to there. The aircraft wouldn't take it there. So Cuba is the blockade is serious to a level uh, which we really can't understand. And we see the tip of the iceberg in this country uh, when it uh, comes to the blockade. But we, we do our best to try and highlight the extraterritorial nature of the blockade and highlight those cases that I've referred to and campaign against them. But it is, is an incredibly, incredibly difficult thing, particularly because most of those companies, you know, your Just Givings, your Eventbrites, your PayPals, they're kind of multi, you know, they're not based in any one place, you know, trying to pin down PayPal because they won't trade with Cuba. I mean, God help us, you know, they're all over the world. And, and you know, we, you can't even go to their office. You don't even know where they are. They're out there on the, in the internet somewhere. It's very, very difficult to campaign against some of these companies who don't seem to be, uh, um, susceptible to to sovereign or, or to nation states anymore. 
you know they're almost more powerful but you can see with the tax you know look at amazon and tax they're more powerful than nation states so if you're trying to impose your policy on, on amazon or eventbrite or on just giving it's very 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 difficult the us economy is massive massively powerful and that's the main reason why all these corporations uh, make their choices it's about money it's about profit they're not in it for the moral position they're in it to make profits and to make profits they need the united states they need the dollar i think in terms of like the effects on the cuban nation as well i mean the, the number that's sort of quite quite a lot of uh, 753.69 billion dollars and counting the effect it's had on the, the cuban economy um and the other thing to mention as well is that since 1992 the UN General Assembly has passed a resolution every year condemning the ongoing impact of the embargo um, on Cuba. Every year, well, under Obama, did Israel and the United States were the only ones that abstained. Now they're actively voting against the resolution again. Um, but again, this brings a lot of context into why Cuba has acted, uh, the way it's acted in certain ways on, on, on the international stage. I mean, with regards to... Obviously, there's an ideolo ideological link with the USSR, but the reason that, for example, you know, they had to have strong links with the, with the USSR is because they didn't have access to the world markets like any other country is allowed to because the US, like you say, strangled them. And also into, on top of that context is the fact that then you don't just bring the economic um, stranglehold that America had on Cuba for all these years, you also have the Bay of Pigs, the multiple assassination attempts of Castro, which is really funny listening to him joke about how many times they've tried to kill him and failed, but that's another point. But just maybe that that context as well is that both the, as a result of the blockade and then a result of making sure that they could secure the revolution, that how that relationship then grows with, for example, like the USSR. I mean, people of my dad's generation, when you speak of Cuba, if they're not maybe on the left, just remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. I'm not sure people of mine and Morgan's age and generation would that has the same sort of uh, imprint in the psyche but for the cuban missile crisis it's all automatically cuba bad that's how it's seen but again in the context of multiple assassination attempts uh the bay of pigs where they try and overthrow the um the cuban government all the other attempts you can see why these things happen and why cuba took these stances to secure the revolution and to secure the gains they've made for the the people of cuba yeah, I mean, they, they they wanted a better world for the people of Cuba. They they wanted to improve the lives. That's how I see it, you know, and uh, they were given two choices. You know, the Americans said, well, that's not what's going to happen. You know, we want to carry on like we were before with an elite. And, uh, you know, that's what's going to we're going to carry on with. And Cuba was given no choice. They had no connections to the Soviet Union whatsoever. It was it was a complete world apart. There was no desire by Fidel or anyone in Cuba to have relations with the with Soviet Union. It wasn't even on their horizon. You know, Cuba didn't really become uh, socialist or even Fidel didn't even declare himself Marxist till the 70s. You know, it, it wasn't that was not the dream of the revolution. The revolution was a nationalist revolution. You know, it was it was about nationalism. It was about Cuba for the Cubans. And, and it still is today very much a nationalist kind of revolution. Um, it's got a socialist element to it, but it's predominantly about Cuba for the Cubans and the right of a people to determine their own future. And, uh, you know, that's what it's about. It wasn't a bunch of communists came along and said, right, we're going to have communism here. And that was never the situation at all. So I think, um, obviously, the, the relationship, thank God for the Soviet Union at the time. You know, if there hadn't been for the Soviet Union at the time, Cuba would not have survived. That's the reality of the situation. Um, and that was the reality of the situation for many li liberation struggles around the world. You know, Vietnam or, or South Africa, you know, if they didn't have a, a, a bipolar world at the time, it would have been virtually impossible for those. That's what the situation was when you had a predominant imperialism across the world that was run by the Western powers. And that was all there was. You know, there was no, you, you had a little revolution somewhere. It just got crushed. You know, it didn't, you didn't have any friends around the world to, to help you. So, you know, you, that's why the bipolar world was, was, was of, the, of the 70s and 80s was a different world. You know, it was very different. There were two poles and, and people in uh, Angola or wherever could stand up and could actually ask for help. From somebody against the dominant superpower so it was very very different and uh, of course the soviets had their own reasons for whatever you know you you can argue about that or to you blue in the face to give support to cuba 
uh, you know, people, you, know, you get all the people at, you know, the, the sort of war, war uh, academics and so on saying, oh, well, the, the Russians wanted, you know, strategically to get into the Caribbean and this stuff. I mean, you can, you can go around and around the houses with all that sort of stuff. At the end of the day, Cuba needed to survive. They'd had a revolution. They tried to carry on. They needed to buy stuff. And uh, the Americans did told them they couldn't. So they went to where they could. They would have gone to Britain. They would have gone to France. They would have gone anywhere to get it. And they still do today. You know, they, they go around the world trying to find people to trade with. It's, it's what they have to do to survive. Um, so I, I think the history of Cuba, as, as you said, you know, for, for many people here, they kind of have glimpses of it. I mean, the missile crisis is a very interesting situation. Cuba was very much in the middle. Of, a, of the superpower, you know, the, the arms race, and it was just there, you know, the Cubans weren't looking to have missiles, they didn't really want to be participating in some uh, nuclear Armageddon or, <laughs> but they, you know, they, they were there, the Russians said we want to put the missiles there, Cuba had just been invaded and it kind of all came together and that's what happened, but uh, it wasn't a, a, a desired out, it wasn't the desired position of the, the uh, Fidel or, or the Cubans to have a load of missiles, that's, they've never, been a militaristic kind of setup in that it's, respect. It's like you say that, like for example, that hits that is in the psyche of people. But like you know, you mentioned South Africa there, the strong links between the Cuban government and the anti-apartheid movement when Britain was supporting apartheid. That history is never is, I mean, is never I mean, told. You, no, the the history of South Africa is phenomenal. You could do the whole meeting on that. I mean, um, you know, the, the Cubans supported the South Africans and the Angolans because the Angolans asked for help. And uh, Cuba had a, an anti-imperialist uh, role in the world as a leader of the, uh, the non-aligned movements. Um, and Fidel spoke about it at length, as did Che Guevara, about, you know, we, we need to create a thousand Vietnams and all this kind of stuff. They believed in national liberation for people across the globe against imperialism, as they had. And when the Angolans asked for support, they, they started to give them support, you know, and then they the South Africans invaded, you know, Angola, and it kind of it snowballed and snowballed. This was not a, a Russian kind of game. The Russians weren't really involved in it. It was very much Cubans, and it was a that was an ideological struggle. They'd done that from the early days of the revolution. They helped the Algerians, you know, in the 1960s, one year after the revolution. They were involved in helping uh, the Algerian independence struggles. So they, they had a whole history of doing it, and, and Angola and then South Africa was... A continuation of that and when the South African Defence Forces invaded uh, Angola you know went up through Namibia and invaded Angola and as you said yourself you know backing Savimbi and the the, the far right race you know the, the horrible uh, crowd who were backed by the United States and by Thatcher um, the Cubans sent troops over there uh, of their own fruition and they defeated the South African Defence Forces and that was the first time that the racist uh, South African army had ever been defeated and from their position of invincibility which is how they were seen across the, the world at the time they they were the, the the main people in Africa they could do what they wanted they were defeated by these bunch of uh, you know Caribbean Cubans it was quite a thing and the battle at Kino Car of Carnivale changed the history of Africa because for the first time the South Africans were defeated, that led ultimately to the defeat of the apartheid regime and the freedom for Mandela. And when Mandela came out of Robin Island, the first country Mandela went to outside of Africa was Cuba. And you know, that history is not told, but there it is, there's the footage of it. Mandela in Havana, cheering crowds, meets Fidel, well, you must come back, visit me in Johannesburg. The first country, it wasn't, you know, come and see Britain and, you know, Bono, Bono or uh, Hillary Clinton or something. It was Fidel and it was Havana. And people don't tell that story. And they don't, they forget, as you said yourself, that, you know, young Tories were going around with badges saying, hang Mandela. That was the position of our country. And yet Cuba, who stood on the side of the, uh, the righteous, really, in South Africa, played an incredible, incredible role and has done throughout history, really, and uh, continues to do so. And I'm sure we'll talk about it if we have time about what they're doing now with their medical internationalism and so on. So, um, you know, Cuba has a has a has a not only is, is it a country that's proud of itself and confident of itself. And the people are Cubans who are confident, you know, they're they love their boxers who are out there in the world. They love their ballet dancers, you know, their Carlos Acosta. They love their music, their film. It punches above its weight as a little island. It's an incredible mix of uh, amazing things to celebrate. You know, the health statistics, the education statistics. Uh, just so much about Cuba is, is wonderfully fascinating and beautiful. Um, and they're very, very proud of it. And I'm very proud to be associated with them. But not only 
are they proud of themselves? They they share what they have in many ways, you know, be it health or education. You know, there are thousands of Cubans all around the world helping. There are more Cuban doctors abroad than the whole of the World Health Organization and Medicine Sans Frontier put together. You know, the, the Cubans are all over the place. There's about 50,000 of them right now across the developing world in medical missions all around the place. So Cuba is an incredible uh, country in that respect, in its internationalism. And, and COVID really has really, uh, really highlighted that. And hopefully we'll get to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, we'll definitely talk about that. Um, it's been incredible to see some of that stuff. Um, so obviously um, Cuba establishes this relationship with the USSR and it kind of, it gives it a bit of hope in a, in a very you know, hopeless scenario after the uh, blockade sets in. Um, but obviously that doesn't last forever because the USSR doesn't last forever. Um, so how, how, if we talk a bit about how life has been um, since the fall of the USSR for Cuba, what, what, have, what have they turned to? Maybe we'll talk a bit about um, Venezuela and has the kind of economic conditions of people there worsened in recent years because of that? We say recent years, it's been 30 years now since the fall of the Soviet Union, but if we, yeah, so since that, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, those 30 years, I, mean, I, yeah. I went in 1978 and Cuba was a, a wonderful, wonderful country. It had everything they could ever want. The people were, yeah, all having a great time, quite frankly. The, the, the sugar went over to the Soviet Union and the ships came back with food and everything you could ever want. And, and as long as you didn't mind eating, you know, tinned fish or uh, tinned <laughs> vegetables, you could have as much food as you wanted. And Cuba was a wonderful place. And it was in that period of the 70s and the 80s when, you know, there was a real flourishing of cinema and dance and arts, because really, quite frankly, Cuba was doing very, very well. Thank you very much. You know, it had a very good position. Uh, like I say, it had good trades with the, the Eastern European, the Comic Con countries. Sugar was enough. And as long as they produced the, the sugar, then everything else kind of carried over and ticked over. There were Russians over there, Romanians, Bulgarians, and so on. And Cuba was, was, was that sort of country. It was doing quite well, thank you. And education and everything flourished. Obviously, the collapse of the Soviet Union was something that, you know, it changed everything in Cuba overnight. Um, it was overnight it was in weeks you know it went to, they lost something like 80 percent of their uh, foreign trade overnight their economy collapsed completely and utterly collapsed and you know nobody really could imagine cuba being able to survive so the early 90s became known as something called the special period and uh, it was terrible you know there was uh, blackouts there was no electricity uh, the infrastructure just stopped completely uh, i mean i went there quite a lot of times during that period you know, they tried everything, you know, people were on bicycles, um, you know, they, they, they welded together the buses to make one giant bus called a, a camello, uh, you know, like a, a, what's it called, a camel, uh, because then you could just use one engine to pull a, a massive, huge bus along. It was just an endless kind of attempt to try and survive in this impossible situation. Um, and, you know, I, I, I've met people and, and I, I've witnessed it for myself, the severity of that period and i don't think it's a history that's really been written or talked about partly because the cubans don't want to talk about it because it was so horrible but cuba was starving people were starving you know i've talked to families they, they talk about going up and taking the bark off the trees and stewing it up for their for their lunch you know that was the level of the desperation and the situation in cuba and for a country to survive through that is one of the most amazing uh, uh, histories uh, of humanity really because it was a, a, a really really terrible time that went on for four or five years um so the special period was awful it led to tourism because before the 90s there wasn't really any international tourism it, you know when i went there was you know i went to varadera there was like one little guest house there you know it was like there was no no hotels but in the early 90s you know cuba needed money and the one thing they had they didn't have oil they didn't have gas the one thing they had was beaches and if you get international tourists to come, they bring money with them. And it's immediate money. You don't have to wait five years. It comes on the plane with the tourists. They spend it and you get cash. And that's when the tourism economy began, really. Uh, in there. It, was a, it was an attempt to get money. And uh, you've got to think of the mentality of the Cubans who are building these, multi these great big hotels to feed very well-fed Westerners on luxury food items while they themselves are struggling and starving and, and to have that consciousness to be able to do that as a nation is quite an incredible 
uh, quite an incredible um, feat, really, to survive that period. It was it was dreadful. So I think the 90s were awful. Um, it's never really uh, recovered. Obviously, you had a, a blossoming uh, in in with Venezuela and some countries in, in in Latin America. Before that, there was no friends in Latin America. La Latin America was dominated by right wing governments that were dominated by the United States and the organization organization of American states. And you know, any time any country had tried to kind of change, like Chile, it was overthrown. Like Nicaragua, it was invaded. You know, you go through every country there. Whenever any population had, had tried to change their society, it was brutally crushed by US-led uh, coups uh, and invasions. So Cuba was very much on its own. Um, and it was only really when, you know, their worth, Venezuela was incredibly important because of the oil. And that was a bit of a lifeline. Obviously, China was a bit of a lifeline. And, and you know, looking for allies around the world, Cuba has managed to survive. It's done a number of things that I think have been have proven to be amazing decisions, like the development of its own biotech and pharmaceutical industry. Which was, you know, in, in in when they began that, people thought, well, this is bonkers, you know, some little Caribbean island trying to become a worldwide producer of vaccines and stuff. Who was going to understand that? But they did it, and now they're paying the dividends. You know, two of the twenty-seven uh, COVID vaccines uh, in phase three trial, worldwide phase three trials, are Cuban vaccines. It's an incredible achievement for a small Caribbean island to have. Uh, world leading vaccines being produced and, and 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 to the standards set by by the international community so certain things they did were very uh, were amazing obviously there you, you can look at how cuba survived but it's tough and right now at this particular moment in time um it's really really bad and people are talking about a new special period it's not the same as the special period but it is bad you've got you know covid the, the costs of covid You've got the effects on tourism. It's been completely wiped out and tourism has become a, an important avenue. You've got the Trump uh, sanctions, which include the blocking of all uh, remittances, which is basically Cuban-American families sending money back to their families in Cuba, which is incredibly important to the Cuban economy. And you've got the block on Venezuelan oil. So from every sort of angle, Cuba is under a real moment of intense uh, pressure. And the situation on the ground right now is very, very tough for the Cuban people. Uh, and you can't underestimate how tough it is. And, and again, they're having to kind of dig very, very deep uh, to, to convince themselves that they are on the right path because there are plenty of people who are telling them otherwise uh, and trying to uh, meddle and, uh, and get involved and trying to corrupt and trying to build uh, anti-Cuban movements inside and outside of Cuba. Uh, so it's a very, very difficult situation right now i mean my feeling is if they can get through the next few months get to the vaccine get tourism back up maybe biden is a bit of a light although he's not shown any indication of, of change in u.s policy but possibly he might uh obviously you've got some changes in latin america bolivia uh possibly coming in brazil argentina ecuador you can look at these kind of things mexico is very important uh you know you can see there are possibilities for cuba if they can get through this very, very difficult moment in time. Um, but the situation in terms of, as you, you were saying about the living standards of the Cuban people, it's never really since the sort of collapse of the Soviet Union been that great. You know, it, it's tough. There are a lot of issues in Cuba. Housing is a major, major problem, um, you know, for, for Cuban people. It's, 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 the housing stock is not good enough for the population. Um, you've also got a very educated population. You know, most people have degrees people don't want to farm you know people want to they want to be scientists they want to they want to be artists they want to do all that stuff you know they, they've got a very uh i suppose you'd call it a developed world mentality but they're still in a developing world environment and that goes for all aspects in health you know they they, they suffer from first world illnesses you know heart problems diabetes that sort of stuff not third world illnesses but they're still an incredibly poor country and you can't forget that you can't compare cuba with you know, America, really, you've got to kind of look at, uh, 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 you know, if you want to see the good sides of Cuba, you've got to compare Cuba with poor countries in Latin America. And then you can see why Cuba is something to hold on to. You know, if you're poor in, if you're a poor person in the, in the, the, the foothills of Bolivia and, you know, and your two kids get ill and you can't afford a doctor, you think, well, 
blimey, I'd, I, you know, if only I, if I was in Cuba, I'd get a doctor. Or if your kids wanted to become a, a, a dancer or your kid wanted to be a scientist, you've got no hope. You know, if you're poor in those countries, you, you haven't got any choice. Your kids can't become scientists. They can't become dancers or artists. And you think, oh, well, if, you, if only I was in Cuba. So you can see why for the poor of Latin America, and indeed for many poor around the world, Cuba is actually seen as a pretty much of a nirvana, even now. But if you're in Cuba and you've got the internet and you've got, you're highly educated, you might see Cuba a bit differently. So it's a complicated thing. It's not like everybody sees Cuba in one way. It depends on your particular situation and where you are from. But certainly if you're poor in the world um, and you haven't got any choices and, you know, you get ill <laughs> and you haven't got anywhere, you know, you've got, then you think, blimey, I, <laughs> I could do a bit of Cuba in my life. Yeah, absolutely. Um I it, I think it's it is incredible that they've pulled through such difficult times that like we talked talked about in the early nineties, um, and like you say, things haven't really fully um, recovered. And I think we've we've managed to kind of make the point that you know this isn't some fault of communism uh, necessarily. It's to do with this um, this blockade that has basically crippled um, Cuba economically and stolen its. Um, sovereignty from underneath it and, and like we mentioned the sovereignty of large parts of the rest of the world in, in dealing with Cuba as well um, so we've, we've touched on some of the difficulties Cuba's faced in recent years maybe it'd be good now to kind of look at Cuba today um, and look at its history over the past what is it 60 years um, since the revolution and, and and talk about what the real successes are and because obviously like we said like we said earlier people have this negative view of Cuba, at least in the West. Um, and maybe if they knew some of the, the, the successes that Cuba has had in spite of all this, this blockade stuff that we've talked about, then maybe they might see things in a different light. So what are the, what are the main successes? We've touched on some, but what are the main successes of, of the Cuban revolution, really? Well, there, there are many. I mean, you know, you're talking about a very poor developing country. And if you look at the statistics, uh, certainly in health and education, they, they're unbelievable. You know, Cuba has a a lower infant mortality rate than the United States. You know, an infant mortality rate is kind of one of the main uh, statistics that you can talk about. It's about education, it's about healthcare, it's about ratio of doctors and so on. They've got the highest level of doctors per population. Their literacy rates are the best in Latin America, so on and so forth. You can look at statistics till you're blue in the face. You go to Cuba, you see a population that is generally happy, uh, educated, uh, you know, moving forward, intelligent you know it's got all the attributes of a society that you think yeah right this is this is a good place i don't know if you've been there but you step off the plane in cuba and you just think okay you know i can do this you know there's an infrastructure you know the streets are clean the the, the flowers are pruned you know the schools kids go to school they're all in uniform you know people are learning music they're learning dancing they're, they're doing sports it's happening it's a society that you think yeah okay there's no kids begging on the streets there's no kids dying of silly illnesses that you get around the developing world, which are all treatable. But, you know, our, our capitalist world doesn't enable that to happen. There's no people, uh, you know, beating each other up. There's no gangs. There's no, you know, drugs is not an issue. You know, it's just like it's what you would want in a, in a society. Yet it is, uh, as you mentioned, it's uh, hindered and harassed by the blockade and the constant, constant aggression uh, an intervention from the United States at every every possible level, be it uh, within Cuba in international forums of trade unionists or you know intellectuals or in the media or human rights organisations, it's just a constant barrage that they have to defend themselves against. And it really is uh, you know heartbreaking, really, when you see a, a beautiful people who just really want the best for their country. <laughs> They're not asking to uh, invade anywhere or take over anyone else or um, dominate anyone else. They just want to live you know and, and do the best they can so it's very very heartbreaking uh, in that respect so there's obviously social uh, achievements you know social care the elderly are looked after you know there's community organizations it's endless you know you, you, lgbt rights are brilliant in cuba compared to the rest of latin america there's just so much about it that is progressive and uh, enjoyable and and praiseworthy and then of course there's um you know other achievements like their internationalism you know, we talked about South Africa, but, that, you know, that was a, a kind of military uh, in a way. But, you know, the, the humanitarian internationalism is something unbelievable. You know, I remember uh, we brought a doctor over who'd been to Pakistan following the Kashmir earthquake in uh, 2005. Terrible, earth, ter terrible earthquake. And, um, 
you know, they'd sent 600 people to the Himalayas where this earthquake was in Pakistan. Well, imagine these human doctors, you know, marching up and down in the foothills of the Himalayas with all the snow. And there's this film about it, you know, it's just like amazing. And most of them are women because most of the medical, you know, women play an incredible role in Cuba. I was going to say, the, on your it's site, it's, it's the, majority, the majority of, like, basically the professional... Yeah, it's, profe- it's women. The women prof- professional a, professions are women. The level of... A level involvement is unbelievable. They've, I think they've got second or third highest number of women MPs, you know, ratio in the in the world. But so most of these doctors were women, and of course that helped tremendously in 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 uh, Pakistan uh, because you know women treating women and so on in those communities. And by the end of um, and this was at a time when Cuba had no diplomatic relations with with uh, Pakistan. Pakistan was led by Musharraf, a dictator. There was no diplomatic relations. Cuba offered, they went. By the end of it, there were 600 Cuban medics over there. And by the end of the six months, they stayed after this terrible, terrible earthquake. And after all the British kind of emergency rescue people and the dogs and the TV cameras had all gone home, um, you know, after a couple of weeks or whatever it was, the Cubans were still there. By the end of their stay in in Pakistan, 73% of all medical interventions, of all medical interventions were carried out by Cubans. So three quarters of all the medical treatments were carried out by these Cubans. Now, of course, Cuba has very good relations with Pakistan now. <laughs> you know, with Pakistani doctors learning medicine in Havana and vice versa. Yeah, you can say, oh, well, that's all about medical diplomacy. But at the end of the day, you know, that's what it was. In the Ebola crisis, you know, in, in 2015 in West Africa, you know, Cuba was asked by the World Health Organization, alongside France, Britain and the United States, to help. That's the level of their expertise. So they sent Cuban doctors to West Africa to help in the Ebola crisis, asked by the World Health Organization. So Cuba has a, a, a you know, in Haiti, across the globe, you know, Cuban doctors have a disaster emergency uh, set up. You know, they offered to go to um, Los Angeles and they after after Katrina, you know, and the Americans said, oh, no, we don't want you know, Cubans, we don't need them. We'll, we'll let our people suffer. <laughs> yeah. Terrible. But the Cubans have got this internationalism, which today means, that, as I said, they've got around 50,000 medical staff working across the globe. And in, 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 in COVID, if we can talk a bit about that, Cuba's got, had, has sent 40 uh, brigades, 40 brigades during the time of COVID to other countries. And that, that video includes... Of not them getting off the plane them. in Italy was just incredible. No, it's, unbelievable. So it's, not even, uh, it's not even just poor countries. So Italy mm-hmm. asked for help. Andorra asked for help. And the Cubans sent doctors to Italy. You know, it's, it's amazing. So in Europe, Cuban doctors being asked to come and going to help Italians deal with COVID. Even the British government has worked with the Cuban government to facilitate four Cuban brigades to go to British overseas territories like the Virgin Islands, Montserrat, Anguilla. So there are Cuban doctors in those places, which are British kind of, I don't know where you'd describe them. We've still got these kind of colonial little outposts. I think they're overseas territories, they're called, a bit like protectorates or something. But, so there are Cuban doctors there. So, and, uh, you know, the France had uh, Cuban doctors in, I think, Martinique or one, or Guadeloupe, one of their places. So Cuba's all over the place. Uh, and that in itself is an incredible achievement. I think, you know, the, the COVID vaccine, uh, which they're working on now, they've said already that uh, once they've, um vaccinate their own population then they'll of course share that vaccine and you know that they will with people across the developing world at a price or, or free or whatever that people can afford so cuba's got an incredible heart and they always have this saying that they share what they uh, have not what they have left behind and i think that's an, an incredible testament to the people of cuba and, and that's central really to the characteristics of cuba and, and cuba's revolution that sharing and that humanity and that uh, worldwide outlook and I think that's one of the beautiful legacies of Cuba I think it, that, that would have been a, a lovely pl- a lovely place to end but there's still a couple of points I don't want to take your whole uh, evening Rob because obviously that was just a that was a great sort of finish for a uh, uh, rallying call but I, I just a couple of things I wanted to mention really maybe sort of thinking about what I my perceptions before involving myself in the topic of Cuba um maybe being a bit more soft left before, before going a socialist is the criticism that you always hear from liberals and the soft left. Are, are, I think two things when people try and engage with this topic, one that the Cuba is you hear with Venezuela and all that, that Cuba is an authoritarian regime that it's top down and there's a lack of political uh, 
participation and democracy and all those things. That's one issue. And the other issue that comes up a lot, um, I think, on sort of that from that soft left sort of argument, is that Cuba has a bad record with regards to LGBTQ plus issues. I know they're two very, very big, <laughs> big topics. And again, I don't want to take you a whole evening, but I just sort of wondered what your your view was when when that get, comes up as as two arguments that it's either some it's a uh, authoritarian regime and a regime that um, <clears throat> doesn't accommodate LGBTQ plus issues. I mean, unfortunately, Cubans can't win. You know, if it's not, um, I mean, for about ten years they were being accused of uh, not allowing their population to have internet access. You know. And, you know, that wasn't the case. It was an infrastructural problem. The, the U.S. were blockading them from the international uh, systems that they needed. And then they built a cable to Venezuela. And now Cuba's got one of the highest levels of Internet access. But they were told, you know, everyone was around the world going, oh, they won't let people use the Internet, you know, because if they find out about, uh, you know, Nike trainers and stuff, they'll, they'll, they'll throw out their revolution straight away. You know, it's Cuba can't win. And with LGBT, it was a problem. You know, it's still a problem you know, about the, we know it's a problem over here, you know, the LGBT situation has not been solved, you know, across the world. And in Latin America, in particular, in the Caribbean, it's a terrible situation. You know, you wouldn't want to come out in a lot of Latin American countries, trust me, because your life would be in danger. That is not the situation in Cuba today. You know, those countries, or there's a lot of machismo, uh, which runs right through uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, and Cuba had its own problems with that, you know, and, uh, but, they have changed it and it's now the leading uh, light for LGBT people in Latin America by a long, long way. You know, you can go to the gay parade, the um, Idaho celebrations, which is their gay pride, and you will, you know, you'll have a fiesta of everyone and anyone um, enjoying themselves publicly in Cuba. And, you know, you know, LGBT community is represented in Parliament at different levels and so on. And they've done a lot of work to change that machismo. And, you know, yes, there were issues, but there were in this country, you know, it's not that long ago that LGBT rights, you know, LGBT people were banned, you know, it was only in the uh, late 60s, 70s, when you started to get the legislation changing, which decriminalised the situation. So it's not, it's, it's a, a fairly recent history, even over here. And it's not to say that we have been that wonderful on these these topics ourselves. Um, but the fact is today that Cuba has a vibrant LGBTQ plus community. Uh, there, there are, you know, uh, operations um, trans uh, to change your sex and gender uh, it, it, it is available now within Cuba. Same sex marriage, you know, those kind of things are there. And uh, Cuba is still pushing forward. It's very difficult. It's a conservative co Catholic country still. I mean, in a small C. You know that those kind that kind of uh, small conservatism runs rife across Cuba. It's not um, that everybody's like a, a, a great. You know they don't believe in everything. You know it's still got that element to it, and um, it, it's still got a long way to go. But they are proactively changing their society and doing something about it and campaigning uh, for better rights uh, for the LGBTQ plus community. And, and they're making incredible strides on it. Regarding politics and participation, I mean, when you were, when you were describing um, the, the accusations against Cuba and you were saying about low levels of participation and top down, I thought you were describing UK, but um, it was <laughs> because <laughs> we're, 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 we're running up, and let alone America, we're running up against our own democratic deficits I believe in these countries, which is, a, is very, very worrying, really, in terms of participation. Cuba is not a country that you could accuse of not being participatory. Everybody in Cuba loves a bit of politics and they spend an inordinate amount of their time in political meetings. And sometimes it's impossible to, to do anything when I go over there because they're in yet another uh, political meeting, either at the school or the CDR or the workplace or the local area. It is a culture of, it's a political culture of engagement. It's a very, very different political system you know it's nothing like our one it's not something that every five years you come along and you put a tick in your box and you know it's not party political based at all it's not uh, fed by vast amounts of wealth and power it's nothing like that it's a very very different system it's democratic i call it a democratic system it's a different demo democratic system to our one you know there's a lot of elements of ours and particularly the united states democracy which I could very well do without you know the fact that you need to be a multi-billionaire to be able to run for president is one of those but uh, Cuba isn't like that it's very very different they have members of parliament indeed members of parliament from Cuba come to to the UK and members of parliament from the UK go and visit the Cuban parliament you know they've got a parliament it's got uh, about 600 members uh, 500 members in it the same as ours 
uh, from all over the country. They have uh, uh, councils in the local areas. So Cuba is very, very different, but it is a, is a functioning uh, participatory democracy of a very high order, in my opinion. Now, lots of people will say, you know, uh, it's just different. You know, they don't have multi parties, people stand as individuals. And, and so on and you know that that's how it works but um to say to say that it is a um top-down kind of and people sort of bang on about this dictation you know you go you 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 put five cubans in a room together they, they will all give you their opinion don't you worry about that and their opinions will run rife to slagging off the government the president so and so and so and so it's not that people are you know running scared of anything that's just rubbish and anyone who's been to cuba will know that's just rubbish um cuba is very vibrant in its uh, in its politics um and its uh, uh, its participation its involvement of women of black people of young people of trade unions you know they all have a role in society which is far 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 different to to the role of people here you know trade unions here don't have a right to meet the government and exchange for maybe once every four months or something where they get the tea and the buns or something but in cuba that's implicit that's in you know that's part and parcel of politics you know if you're going to talk about the economy you need the trade union so that's the partnership you work with if you talk about uh teaching and improving education you work with the workers because they are part of it you can't do it without them that's not how it is here and so the women's federation the trade unions the mass organizations of cuba play an intrinsic role in that society far far beyond what we get here and something that we can only aspire to we would love it wouldn't we if the education unions were party to the discussions about the return to teaching or, or the curriculum it just doesn't happen here you know we've got some sort of um you know, private friend of boris's you know doing it it's just a nonsense over here absolute absolute nonsense and it's you know it's a far cry from how i i think we should be running our society so i think cuba is very very different um but you do have to get into it you do have to go you have to meet cubans you have to talk to cubans you can't just read about it in the uh miami times or, or the herald you know you've got to you've got to explore you've got to learn about it and it's vibrant and that's what the cuba solidarity campaign does we bring people over from uh, Cuba to to share that experience. We send loads of people over to Cuba, uh, young trade unionist brigades and so on, so that people can find that for themselves. Because at the end of the day, as we started off at the beginning, you know, Cuba is demonised uh, internationally for all sorts of reasons, and it's our job and the job of people around the world to find out the truth about these things. Um, not just for Cuba, for all sorts of situations uh, around the world. Uh, if we are going to be able to move forward as a society, Cuba is not a straightforward, good and bad situation. You, know, you need to find out about it and you need to make up your own mind. And the best way of doing that is by going to Cuba, meeting Cubans, reading about it and so forth. Yeah, I mean, the way you describe it, it seems to me that what it is, that what, what the, the qualms that people have about Cuba is to do with their own sort of perceptions of what of what a democracy has to be aesthetically because of like it has to include these words like multi-party you know all these different things because that's how a democracy exists here they, we, it's also quite yeah. racist to be honest yeah. with you because yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a northern european vision that we know best you know they talk about the mother of all parliaments you know like the idea that i mean we've got a house of lords for god's sake you know, I mean, the, uh, when you talk to a Cuban and you describe the House of Lords, they just can't, they literally look at you like you're living in the Dark Ages. You know, you've got these people who are the sons and daughters of rich people who are then hereditarily, you know, get hereditary paces. How do you think that looks to a Cuban? You know, when a Cuban is <laughs> explaining our parliamentary democracy and the Queen, you know, and you just think, well, hang on a minute. And then we're, we're pointing the finger at Cuba. It just really is, is you know, well, like, it's, it's the world turned upside down, quite frankly. In the US, that they can't even, Amazon workers can't even get a union organised and going. That must seem, when unions play such an important role in a Cuban's life, that must just seem crazy that you can't, you can't even form a union, never mind have it sort of sat around the table of power, sort of deciding how, how the whole country can, can work better. But yeah, I, I'm with Morgan and, and, and yourself that it's, it's this, uh, Western warped view of, of what is right and anything outside of that domain is um, just seen as completely yeah it's, it's backwards to, to to people that that there can be possibly another system that that all works yeah absolutely um 
so I think we've done a good job of covering things in in the time that we've had. Uh, it's hard. I to... really could. I really could be here all night. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There, there, there's so I've been here twenty years, so it, uh, I've got a long time. <laughs> uh, so I think um, a good place to kind of wrap it up is, is to talk about the work of of your organisation of Cuba Solidarity Campaign. Um, so yeah, if you could kind of summarise the kind of work. Obviously, we, we've touched on some stuff, um, some of the cases that you fought. Um, but yeah, if you could summarize kind of what your organization organization has been up to um, uh, the last however many years yeah. and um, and also how people can get involved and help out a little bit as well. OK, great. Well, I mean, people can get involved. We, we, we're a membership organization. You, you pay uh, 20 pounds to join for a year. You pay eight pound if you're unwaged. So students and uh, anyone not working. And we publish a magazine four times a year, QBC magazine. And, uh, you know, you can find out all about that on, on, on our website at uh, cuba-solidarity.org.uk, which I'm sure you know, people can find out if they just Google or, or look for Cuba Solidarity. So we're a membership organisation, obviously trade unions. If you're a trade unionist, you can get your branches to affiliate and so on and so forth. In terms of what we do, obviously, we, uh, well, we have 30 local groups around the country in towns and cities across um, England and Wales. We've got a sister organisation in Scotland. Um, and so they put on events locally in public meetings with speakers, film shows, whatever. So it's about information sharing and uh, so on and so forth. You can go to Cuba. We run uh, lots of brigades. We send about 400 people, or we used to send about 400 people a year to Cuba on delegations from trade unions, uh, working holidays in, in Cuba. Uh, study tours and so on and that's all on our website as well we sell books and information about Cuba and films about Cuba but our main focus and all of that work is all geared to one thing which is really to lobby our British government to have better relations with Cuba because that's the purpose of a UK-based organisation it's not to sell Che Guevara t-shirts or um, you know dance to the music I mean we do all those things but we do them to bring people into Cuba to find out about Cuba, learn about Cuba, to build an organisation and to pressure the British government. And we want the British government to maintain its policy of engagement with Cuba, but to improve on that and to, to you know, uh, boost trade with Cuba, backwards and forwards, to boost educational exchange with Cuba, medical exchange with Cuba, tourism to Cuba, everything in terms of building better relations and to, to stand up against a policy of aggression and sanctions and isolation, which is emanating from the United States. Now, obviously, Britain is a key player in that because of our historic relationship uh, with the United States. So our main efforts at the moment are about pressing the British government. For example, we right now got an early day motion in Parliament, uh, uh, which was tabled by Graham Morris, which we're supporting. And we're urging people to write to their MPs. And just over 1,000 of our members have now written directly to their MPs using our online action but that can be anybody right to their MPs urging them to support that early day motion which is all about uh, calling on the British government to improve its relations uh, with Cuba and develop those and oppose the US uh, listing of Cuba as a, a state sponsor of terrorism which is something that Trump did in the last days of his presidency so that's a very important thing we've been celebrating Cuba's role in the coronavirus uh, pandemic we run a very big campaign to nominate the Cuban medical teams for the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, and we were pleased to get, I think, 28 members of parliament to officially nominate the Cuban medics for the Nobel Peace Prize and a load of academics as well. So about 40 uh, nominations from this country and about 10,000 people uh, backed that campaign. So those kind of things are, are what we're doing. In the early days of the pandemic, we, we organised an international uh, petition which was signed by nearly 20,000 people worldwide, calling on the US to temporarily lift the blockade to help Cuba fight the pandemic at home and abroad. So they're the sorts of things in line with uh, the situation. Now, we're obviously very big with the trade unions over here. So we do a lot of work trying to link British trade unions with their, their counterparts within Cuba and vice versa. So we do a lot of that kind of stuff, like bringing Cuban trade unions over here, organising at trade union conferences around the country, getting motions passed, but equally, we then also do a lot of fundraising, material aid campaigns. We did a huge campaign with the National Education Union recently, which resulted in us in sending 8,000 musical instruments to Cuba on two big 40-foot um, shipping containers. And again, that's A, because Cubans love music and they've got a real problem getting equipment. Uh, you know, people are sharing like a clarinet between a whole orchestra or something, you know, and it's just very, very difficult for them. And it was something that people could do, you know, give away their instruments over here. I mean, partly because there's no 
school education in, in, in musical education has gone down to Swan year and people can't learn instruments. So there's loads of instruments in attics, which could be very well used by people who want to learn instruments in Cuba. Uh, that was a wonderful thing. And it illustrates the blockade and that's to break the blockade. Uh, we've got an ongoing campaign raising funds for Braille machines. We, the, we've sent around 50 Braille machines for kids who uh, visually impaired kids because they can't get the Braille machines from the United States. It's a US company. Uh, very practical things like that. And obviously we campaign whenever we can against the extraterritorial impacts of the, uh, the blockade and trying to highlight those particular campaigns. So we're right now in a campaign about just giving and we're working with some lawyers and some members of parliament to raise that campaign up to really highlight the fact that this uh, US blockade is extraterritorial and is impacting on people in Britain. And if we can draw out that difference you know, that, that, that contradiction between what the United States wants to do and supposedly what Britain wants to do in terms of engagement with Cuba. That is our point, really, of leverage uh, in this country. And that's the one we really want to focus on uh, going forward. Um, you mentioned the UN vote, which is coming up in May. And obviously, we'll be pressing the British government to maintain its position of voting against the blockade um, at the United Nations when that vote comes up. So lots of stuff we do. Um, we, we would normally be doing lots of music and dance and public events and so on. We run a big Latin America conference each year, at, uh, uh, which looks at all the countries of Latin America, and we kind of run that conference, uh, which has been very, very successful. So you, know, you can't separate Cuba from Latin America, so the, the, you, you need to discuss the whole thing. So we do all and sundry, really. We, we're very open to all sorts of suggestions. We're very vibrant, um, and we work, uh, you know, we, we've got a number of staff who work incredibly hard and a, a, an executive committee which is elected every year and brilliant, brilliant members up and down the country who all work tirelessly uh, in solidarity with Cuba. So if anyone's listening and they want to get involved, um, it's a brilliant cause and uh, you'd be more than welcome to get involved with uh, solidarity with Cuba. Brilliant. I was just going to say, like, I'll definitely be signing up and um, would love to get involved. Um, it's been great talking to you, Rob. Thank you very much for coming on. It uh, means a lot to us. It's been great. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank, thank you very much for the time. Very good. Um, yeah, so if everyone wants to check out um, the work of Cuba Solidarity Campaign, it, the website is cuba-solidarity.org.uk. You can have a look at what, you know, how you can get involved at joining up maybe. Um, yeah, it's all on there. And also just information about Cuba, some really useful sources on there as well. We'll put stuff in the show notes as well for people for trade union branches to affiliate. I'll definitely talk talk at my next branch about getting the affiliation sorted to, to Solidarity, to the, to the campaign. Um, so yeah, just for me as well. Thanks, Robin. Obviously, solidarity forever with the Cuban people and, and everyone in that struggle. Brilliant. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Morgan. It's been great. Cheers. Thanks for listening, everyone. Bye bye. Hay en mi Cuba una nueva vida. Hay en mi Cuba una nueva vida, hay en mi Cuba una nueva vida, hay en mi Cuba una nueva vida. Soy obrero de mi Cuba, trabajo con gran tesón, porque la patria me pide aumentar la producción. Ahora es mía la herramienta que cuido con gran placer. Somos los trabajadores que estamos en el poder. Hay en mi Cuba una nueva vida. 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 Al alcance de mi mano, mi fusil alerta está, por si acaso los espirros se quieren equivocar. Los domingos con mis hijos voy al círculo social, donde antes los obreros no podíamos entrar. Hay en mi Cuba una nueva vida, hay en mi Cuba una nueva vida, hay en mi Cuba una nueva vida, hay en mi Cuba una nueva vida.
mi Cuba una nueva vida. Hay en 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 mi Cuba una nueva vida. Aumentar mi compañero. Aumentar la producción. Que mi fábrica se alegra en ritmo de emulación. Nueva vida de mi Cuba, cuánto orgullo da saber que aquí nadie retrocede, nunca nos podrán vencer.